James Art there, Director of Energy Efficiency Programs. Uh, basically, I, I work with the Michigan Electric Co-op Association, which is a statewide association to help uh, uh, the Michigan co-ops uh, uh, do their business. Let's first talk about understanding energy and how it affects our lives and what we can do about it. There's basically what we call the energy equation. Uh, it, it, it entails the house shell, everything that goes on with the, the construction of the house, with, uh, what's made of the house, the windows, the insulation, the siding, uh, the basement, whether there is one or isn't one, if it's on a slab, all of this stuff has an impact, impact on, on energy. Uh, what's in the house, our house systems, that's our water heaters we've talked about, our furnaces, our air conditioners, our lamps, refrigerators, microwave stoves, cell phones, TVs, plasma TVs, all that kind of stuff uses energy. Uh, and then our occupant behavior. How do we use that stuff? Do we keep the window open? Uh, do we keep adjusting the thermostat over here? Do we keep our water heater at 140 because we like it nice, steam, <coughs> pipe and hot? That's this stuff here. And all that can add up into a, a lot of energy. Uh, so, so, so the combination of doing our, our homework here, doing our homework here, and doing our homework here, all adds up into how we can save ourselves some serious dollars moving forward. A typical home today, here's the other thing we want to understand, is where is all our energy going? And here in Michigan, it's different if we're in Florida, because, uh, because the, the, the cooling is, is a much bigger portion and the heating is hardly anything at all. But here in Michigan, what we have is our heating and air conditioning accounts for over half of our energy use in a year in, in our particular home. Uh, you add our hot water cost to that, and now we're, we're, we're <coughs> practically at 90% of our energy cost is in our heating, our cooling, and our hot water right there. So think about that. You want, to, you want to keep that in your mind. If you want to make the biggest dent in your energy bill, these are the, the, the three places we're going to be looking at. Your air conditioner, your heating, and your hot water. 11% on your appliances. We're talking about your TVs, your ovens, your dishwashers, and refrigerators, and things of that nature, and your lights, uh, and stereos, and all, everything else that we got. So here we're looking at the consumption, and we're looking at your kilowatt hour use, and, and where all that's at. Again, it's all right here. Okay. I'm going to show you a little bit about geothermal heating and cooling. This is talking about the, 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 uh, uh, the largest uh, opportunity to save money. Because the Earth absorbs and stores much of the energy it receives from the sun as heat, underground temperatures remain constant at a point between 42 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit year-round, depending on where you are in the United States. A geo-exchange system can use this energy source to economically heat and cool almost any kind of building, heat water, provide refrigeration, and perform many other kinds of applications. A geo-exchange system is made up of three components. A heat pump, usually located inside the building where it's protected from the environment and vandalism. An underground heat exchanger to act as a heat sink to store energy in the earth when cooling and to extract energy from the earth when heating and a distribution system, such as air ducts, or hydronic radiant floor tubing, to provide comfort control for the building space. The two types of heat exchangers commonly used are open loop and closed loop. A closed loop system uses a system of continuous underground pipe loops in which both ends of the pipe system are connected to the heat pump, thereby forming a sealed closed loop water, or a mixture of water and environmentally friendly antifreeze, circulates through the loop to transfer heat between the heat pump and the earth. In some installations, the pipes of a closed loop system can be placed in a horizontal trench dug below the frost line. The number of pipes in each trench and the number of trenches needed will vary depending on the size of the geo-exchange system being installed and the type of soil found in the area. To minimize trenching, slinky coils, spring-like coils of polyethylene pipe, can often be used to increase the pipe surface area and thus the heat exchange per foot of trench. Another way to increase the heat exchange rate of a closed loop system is to take advantage of the naturally higher heat transfer capability of water over soil or rock. 
If a stream, river, or pond of sufficient size is available, coils of heat exchanger pipe can be installed on or near the bottom to form a pond loop system. In locations where space is limited or a large heat exchanger is required, the pipes of a closed loop geo exchange system can be installed vertically in wells drilled into the earth. As with the horizontal and pond loop systems, the number of loops and the depth of the wells needed in a vertical closed loop system are determined by the size of the building, system demands, the ground temperature, and other variables. Since it's not necessary for the heat exchanger to be connected to the rest of the system above ground, whichever type is installed can be placed within existing landscaping, under sidewalks, driveways, and parking lots, or even beneath the building itself. In an open loop system, on the other hand, groundwater from an aquifer is pumped through one well and passes through the heat pump where heat is added to or extracted from it. The water is then discharged back to an aquifer or harnessed for other water management uses. Because the system's water supply and discharge are not connected underground, the loop is open. Um, let's talk about this geothermal a little bit. Basically what it is, is it's really solar. Uh, as the video was talking about, what it's doing is it's tapping into the earth, the, the, the heat that's in the earth. And that, that heat is, it comes from the sun. So basically we're, 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 we're capitalizing on something that's there uh, every single day that we keep walking across. Didn't really realize that it could, uh, could actually heat and cool our home. Uh, when you look at what happens with, uh, with the solar energy, a little technical, but uh, you're, here, you're here today to learn something, right? But I'll bet you didn't know this, that 47% of the heat of the sun is absorbed in the earth every single day. About half of it goes somewhere else. It's either absorbed by the atmosphere, it's refl reflected off the earth. This 2% reflected off the earth, half, actually it's the, uh, the polar ice caps uh, where that gets reflected. Uh, most of it's rejected by the clouds or reflected into space from, uh, from our uh, atmosphere. Okay, now the Earth. The Earth's temperature it varies. So here we are. We're up here in northern Michigan. Okay, so uh, if I was down here in Florida, I'd be I'd be telling a different story, uh, because down here you can see it's almost the Earth's temperature down there is almost 80 degrees. Up here in northern Michigan, you see we're getting down in here where the average of Michigan altogether is about 50 to 52 degrees. But you see, once we get up uh, here in north, this this is where I live over here, Saginaw Midland Bay City area. Once you start getting up in this area here, we're starting to get closer to that 42 degrees. And I do a lot of, uh, a lot of work up in the UP, and you can see we're actually in the high 30s. Uh, this varies. You sit there and you think, okay, 42 degrees, for crying out loud, you're telling me, Art, that I'm going to be able to heat a house for, if I'm going to use the Earth's temperature of 42 degrees. Where's all this other stuff coming from? It's like, okay, I can understand where you're getting 42 degrees, but I like it 74 in my house, <laughs> right? But uh, where's all that heat come from? Well, I'll tell you, it's a neat little thing. It's a, it's a technology we use for years, uh, and it, it actually occurs in your refrigerator. And uh, we use a, a, a neat little thing called refrigerant. And the reason we use refrigerant is because it's a highly unstable thing. We can actually play with that, and it, uh, it, we, we can change the properties. Uh, refrigerant, uh, if I compress it, it gets really, really hot. And if I expand it, it gets really cold. That's a neat thing, right? So. What I can do with it then is I can get heat to move. And what geothermal does is it uses the second law of thermodynamics. But the second law of thermal, uh, uh, of thermal dynamics is that heat will move to where there is no heat. So now that I've got a substance that I can make either really hot or really cold, I can then get heat to move in a direction one way or the other. First, let's talk about the geothermal. Uh, with the geothermal, I'm getting all that free energy out of the Earth. So basically, one unit of electricity, I take a little bit of electricity, uh, I was getting a little ahead of myself there, but the little bit of electricity is going to run that compressor, that blower, and the recirculating pump. That unit of electricity is going to grab three units of geothermal energy out, and it actually equates to four units total, which means it's an effective 400% efficient. All right? That is fantastic. When you talk about gas furnaces or, or, or fuel oil furnaces or anything with a fossil fuel, even a wood burner or a corn burner or anything like that, when we burn something, when we convert that property into heat, we have to exhaust the pollutants. And when we push those pollutants out through the chimney or the flue, that's where we lose our efficiency. So anytime we combust something, it's going to be an efficiency less than one. It used to be that a 78% a, a furnace was fairly efficient. Then we got into the 80s and the 90s. 
Now we're moving into the 92s, the 94s, the 96s. We're actually starting, we're getting very, very close to that one. But we're not going to get over one as long as we're going to burn something. Now most we're ever going to get is about 99. Uh, but so we're getting more and more efficient. And here's the, the example of the fossil fuel furnaces. One unit of fuel, we're going to vent 10, 5 to 20% of that out to venting, and that's where we lose our efficiencies. Okay? When you compare the efficiencies then to a geothermal, quite frankly, now uh, we've got newer technologies. There's some units out there that are in the six, 600% efficient. But geothermal, 400%. The next most efficient thing, and we're going to talk about these two, is the air source heat pump. Okay? These are the most efficient. Now you get into electric resistance, so it's an efficiency of one. Then you start getting into these fossil fuels. And if you still got any of these things out here, a gas propane with a standing pilot light, that's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're, you're, you're burning that and, and paying the, the company for it and you're getting no use out of it. The most inefficient technology right there. Look at how much you could move up, up this, up this uh, efficiency uh, ladder here and get into a better situation. So now with the geothermal system, remember that first part? 50% of that energy now is coming out of the ground and that's free. So now, now we've, we've, we've cut that in half. So now you, you've taken your heating and cooling costs and, and, and virtually uh, cut, cut your, your, uh, your expenses in half. A lot of people say, well, what's it look like? Well, it looks really like your, 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 your furnace. This is a geothermal system here. You've got your supplier, you've got your, your supplier, your return air, your air filter in here. The only difference is, is this gizmo here, instead of a gas valve down here, this is the uh, recirculating pump on a closed loop system that's going out into the yard, recirculating that water uh, through the ground. All right, so we, in the video, we saw the different types of loops. And why do we have these different types of loops? Well, everybody has a little bit of a different situation. Uh, you may not have the space for a, a particular type. Uh, the most common that goes in, uh, particularly when you get to, say, Higgins, Houghton Lake area in South, almost all of them are really going in with this, this closed loop, uh, what's called the horizontal uh, closed loop. You can see this is a nice, heavy, damp soil. That's a really good type of soil for us to get our, our, our heat transfer. Uh, uh, if, if we don't have that, in this, quite frankly, for a closed loop system, you're going to need about 150 feet to 230 feet of space in your backyard, your front yard, your side yard somewhere for a trench, and typically you have three or four trenches. Uh, when you get into sandy soil, that's when we start getting out into that 230 feet because sand is a miserable transfer of heat, so we need more pipe to, to get the heat to move, but we can still do it. This is a polyethylene pipe, when we talk about pipe, uh, we actually thermally fuse that together so there's no mechanical joint fittings to ever fail. Uh, uh, many of the manufacturers will guarantee that for, to, not to leak for 50 or 55 years. If you don't have it, you're thinking, okay, well, I don't have 230 feet, I don't, and these, these, these uh, trenches need to be 10 feet apart from each other. Well, another way to do that is to put these trenches, instead of laying them out horizontally, we can go straight down the ground. And we usually go about 150 feet down on a residential home. We get into two, three, 300, maybe even 400 feet on commercial applications. Uh, so now we, we keep these loops 10 feet apart. Now in a 10 by 10 area, I can do the same amount of heat transfer than I had with 230 feet by 40 or 50 feet. Because now I'm just going straight down. So now you get in a tight spot. Well, why don't we all do it this way? Because you don't have to dig up all of uh, all the art. Well, this costs more. These, these rigs are expensive. They break down a lot. And of course, they've got to cover that expense on the job. So it costs a lot more to do this than it does this. Uh, you saw in the video a pond. If you've got a pond, uh, there's a few little things we have to have. It needs to be about a half acre in size on the surface area. Can't be more than 150 to 200 feet away from the home. So that's the difference in loops. They're all the same efficiency. We're not, one's not more efficient than the other, but some of them cost a lot more than the other. It just all gets down to cost and what you have available in your particular situation.